Hi everyone, my name is Jacob Kang Brown and I'm the Senior Research Associate in the Center on Sentencing Corrections. And I want to welcome you to the Vera Institute today for the Neil Weiner Research Speaker Series. Um, this series invites distinguished scholars and researchers to share their work on justice issues. And it began under the leadership of the late Neil A. Weiner, who is a former senior fellow and research director at the Vera Institute. Following his passing, the series was named in his honor. Um, and I invite you to join us also uh, next month on Tuesday, August 29th. Um, Laura Abrams will be speaking about everyday desistance, the transition to adulthood among formerly incarcerated youth. And you can live tweet along today um, to this talk uh, using the hashtag VeraRSS or Vera Research Speaker Series. Um, but today we're going to be hearing from John Eason, and he's going to be speaking to us about the prison boom in his research. Um, John is an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at Texas A&M University with interests in crime, race, and rural sociology, the sociology of punishment, and urban sociology. Before receiving his PhD at the University of Chicago, he worked as a church-based community organizer focusing on housing and criminal justice issues and served as a political um, organizer, most notably for then Illinois State Senator Barack Obama. Professor Eason's book with the University of Chicago Press is entitled Big House on the Prairie, Rise of the Rural Ghetto and Prison Proliferation. And I really like that title. It investigates the causes and consequences of US prison building and really tells a very unique story and I recommend um, checking out that book. In his most recent project, he collaborates with the National Immigrant Justice Center to investigate health outcomes in immigration detention centers. And his work uses multi-method, multi-level approaches and empirical investigations ranging from imprisonment, prisoner reentry, murder, healthcare access, and health disparities across the rural and urban continuum. So join me in welcoming Professor Eason. Thank you all for having me. Um, before I begin, I would like to uh, thank you all for the in invitation and being such gracious hosts. I'm trying out uh, something new today. Uh, I'm trying to become more, less dependent on paper. Um, I don't let students use laptops in my class, which makes me very unpopular. So I'm actually trying to become more uh, technological, technological uh, uh, forward thinking, and I'm using my smartphone to uh, do this presentation. So uh, if anything un unusual happens, it's because I don't know what I'm doing here. So, um, so scholarly attention to punishment is centered on the causes and consequences of US mass imprisonment being rooted in maintaining racial, political, and economic hegemony. The impact of mass imprisonment on continued racial and economic stratification in the U.S. cannot be overstated. There's a host of scholars from Michelle Alexander, Mark Maurer, to Bruce Western that have demonstrated this. For a decade, more than 2.2 2 million people, for over a decade, more than 2.2 million people uh, have been in prison. It's well documented that the U.S. imprisons its citizens at a higher rate than any other developed nation. You can see every report produced by Vera. While research on mass imprisonment has made significant theoretical and empirical contributions to improved understandings of punishment, studies of mass imprisonment primarily focus on northern poor or urban minority communities. So mass imprisonment is a salient issue calling together cons conservatives and liberals alike before our recent election. There was a, uh, a, a summit between Rand Paul and Cory Booker. They were looking at uh, heading a Senate investigation into uh, mass incarceration, right? However, if we are going to address mass, if we are going to address mass incarceration, we need to better understand prison proliferation. That's what you see right here. Prison proliferation or widespread construction of prisons. Uh, is especially prevalent in non-metropolitan or rural communities. It's resulted in about 1,663 facilities housing these 2.2 million people. Um, they're, conservatively, uh, 
conservatively, we have tw we spent 23 billion in capital costs spanning almost 600 square miles or half the state of Rhode Island since 1970 in, in this project. So, and the seminal piece on the prison bloom, Jeremy Travis claims that the prison has forever altered the physical, social, economic, and political landscape of rural America. Surprisingly, we still know very little about why we built so many. Better understanding pr prison proliferation can reveal the nuanced ways racial and economic inequality intersect with punishment. A closer examination of the persistent, persistence of prison proliferation can also shed light on why rural communities might resist closings and attempt to roll back mass imprisonment. Due to recent budget for, Due to recent budget shortfalls, many states are considering closing facilities as a cost-saving measure. New York is ahead of the game in this sense because you haven't built a prison since 2000 and you've closed about 13 or 14. But New York is not the rest of the country. In fact, New York wasn't even the top, wasn't even top five in prison building. Oklahoma built more prisons than New York. So while many well-intentioned activists and scholars are similarly advocating for prison abolition. Um, we've witnessed other cr crime control policies bring unintended consequences. So rushing to close prisons without considering these consequences may also produce unanticipated repercussions for communities of color in particular. Given that prisons are disproportionately built in rural communities with larger black and Latino population, this this could be an unintended consequence. So, Bruce Weston maintains that mass imprisonment is invisible in the lives of mainstream white Americans and means very little to that segment of society. In contrast, for poor, uneducated Blacks and Hispanic, the criminal justice system has been omnipresent, shaping nearly every existence, uh, every facet of their existence. For many poor rural communities of color, Prison, prolifera prison proliferation represents another shift in the purpose of the prison. We cannot forget that mass imprisonment is not limited to northern urban areas. Rural towns of color experience this as well. I have a recent paper that demonstrates this with uh, Chris Wildeman in the annals. So while we await more information on prison impact, the continued building and maintenance of prisons must be informed by the benefits and costs to rural communities, not just from a high-minded liberal perspective. So um, I'm sure I'm getting a lot of shade on Twitter right now, but that's okay. Um, in 1997, the Bu U.S. Bureau of Prison opened the Forest City Federal Correctional Facility pictured here. Why did the town leaders decide to pursue and build this prison? And more importantly, what can this case study tell us about prison proliferation and potentially rolling back mass imprisonment? From its greatest cultural exports, blues music, to the to production of staple crops like cotton, life in the Mississippi Delta is defined by race and racism, perhaps more than anywhere else in America. While Forest City, Arkansas is held as the birthplace of rhythm and blues singer Reverend Al Green. It was named to honor a more nefarious association. Forrest Town was named after Confederate General Nathan Bedford Forrest, credited with founding the town in 1870, but best known for founding the most infamous domestic terrorist organization in U.S. history, the KKK. This legacy of racism is still palpable in Forrest City, with the Confederate flag prominently displayed on cars and museums, at the county museum and at county fairs. Like many Delta communities, Forest City faced a shifting economic and social landscape after the fall of Jim Crow. In the late 80s, its top white leadership, top white leadership, including political brass like the, the mayor, the chamber of commerce director, state representative, and the county judge began meeting to discuss the possibility of bringing prison to the quote unquote jewel of the Delta, which Forest City is also known as. At distance, many activists would characterize these meetings as smoke filled back rooms with good old boys hatching a white supremacist conspiracy to subjugate African Americans 
in a neoliberal and a neo plantation prison industrial complex. My investigation in the local rural life allowed me to disentangle the much more complex process of placement. As a former community and political organizer on the south side of Chicago, I was such an activist. Uh, I recall one experience that forever changed how, un how I understand the relationship between crime, criminal justice, and race. Um, I, I opened my book with this where we march on the drug house and leaders from my churches afterwards convene and they, they basically say, you either get a job or you become a job, right? That's what they've learned because we're sending, we, we closed the drug house. It, was a, it turns out it's a member of one of uh, our congregations, right? We're out front with 100 people in squat cars and uh, holy water is being sprinkled on their lawn. Um, but they, they took away from this experience that we could be unwittingly contributing to the prison industrial complex, right? So I was, in, I was inspired to go back to grad school um, because in the land of the free, we tripled prison construction in over 35 years. And I was going to go back and figure out how to take down this prison industrial complex. And that's what my book is about. But the research questions I ended up really crafting, these are the three central questions I'm going to give my talk on today, the middle one, how do rural leaders make sense of prison placement? Uh, data has a strange way of changing your mind. So um, I hope you'll be able to walk with me through this. Um, today I'll explore three questions. First, what caused the shift from not my backyard to please in my backyard regarding prison placement? That's an MB to PMB. Second is how does the process of prison placement work in rural towns, or how do they make sense of it? And lastly, how, do prison, how does prison building impact the political economy of rural towns? So the takeaways, uh, while, many, while many believe that uh, prison building is caused by inequality, I argue that white elites and black race leaders in Forest City make sense of pr prison building as a reputation management strategy and response to inequality, specifically the burgeoning rural ghetto in their community. So inequality causes prison building, right? And we need to rethink, uh, we need to have a new theoretical orientation to this, but I'll leave theory and methods somewhat to the side until Q&A. So here's an overview. I'm going to briefly run through a few of my projects, then I'm going to get to the meat of my presentation, which is the book. And I'm going to start with first explaining for those of you who care, uh, the egg, more egghead, more egghead crowd in the room. These are the methods I use. Um, this freedom of information request is more recent uh, as a method uh, that was for the Immigrant Detention Center data. Uh, and that's the first project I have listed here. There are three main projects I'm going to talk about. And by linking context, punishment, and spatial inequality to community process, my program of research challenges existing and develops new theoretical conceptual models of context, punishment, and rural urban processes in several ways. The first is this immigrant detention center project, which should be popping up now. Did I go too far? No, I went too far. There it is. Health and violence. In prison, wait, health violence and immigrant detention. Um, so over the last 20 years, the number of immigrants detained in the U.S. has increased by fivefold as the proportion of Latino detainees swelled uh, by 2010 to nearly 90 percent of all border apprehensions, detentions, and removals. Um, along with this increase in detainees, the number of facilities has expanded, totaling about two, 250. Despite this exponential growth, we know very little about what goes on inside these facilities because of the clandestine, clandestine ways in which they function. For this project, we, we're using no, a novel data set garnered from the Freedom of Information request. And we're looking at 116 of the largest facilities um, between 2007 and 2012. Um, and we're looking across a host of characteristics, including their ratings, their standards, uh, 
number of deaths, suicide, sexual assault, physical assault, and the like, and access to legal authority. So uh, I'll give you a quick, quick and dirty. Uh, from one of these papers, uh, we have a chapter where we look at the conditions and facilities as a predictor of death and suicide, and this will make my prison stuff seem cheery. It's really, it's, it's as bad as we think. Um, there are a number of things that predict death and attempted suicide in these facilities, and none of those things are correlated with uh, the standards or whether or not the facilities pass. So if you're doing it in plain English, you don't have to pass or get good ratings to run an immigrant detention facility, public or private, and you can kill people. It's okay. That's the uh, takeaway from that. And even better news, uh, I think I've studied really depressing stuff. Um, I, I'm also looking to get a project on Arkansas reentry, imprisonment, and health disparities. I can talk more about this afterwards um, as well. And lastly, this is the main project. Uh, this study uh, uses municipal level national data, included geocoded matches of the prison population, 1,663 facilities across the universe of the U.S. Census places. These data took three years to compile and cost $50,000. Um, this isn't county level, this is U.S. Census place, so we can get a very granular uh, um, look at uh, the impact and uh, causes of prison building. Um, and for other eggheads that I've already met with, like me, um, I could give them more data on this later as well. Um, this is how prison building looked in 1970, whenever this decides to come up or prior to 1970. This is just rural prison building. Um, and this is how it looks since 1970. We built 1,152. These are only the rural ones. Um, this tripling of facilities is known as the prison boom. Once again, I want to differentiate the prison boom from mass imprisonment here, which refers to the 2.2 million people that are incarcerated. Additionally, prison building, constructing or erecting a prison within a municipality is inherently a political process as local, state, and even federal institutions must cooperate and coordinate through the process. This is my basic model. Um, this is a town I based it on Forest City. White elites, um, for those of you who can see that, I hope you can see that in the back. White elites, the five to 10 families, typically in a small rural town that own about 50% of the land, uh, they want to build a prison. They form a growth coalition by either formally or informally co-opting middlemen or black leaders or Latino leaders, right? So this is, I'm telling you up front, there are black people that want the prison built, right? So more shade on Twitter, I'm sure. Uh, and this is in response to the burgeoning rural ghetto, the rise of the rural ghetto, which I'll show you how that comes about, because no one talks about a ghetto as a rural, uh, as a rural uh, institution or entity, right? And the prison, even though it's stigmatized, is seen as uh, um, a first aid or a way to improve the town's image, which is very counterintuitive, but um, uh, you know I'll walk you through all of that. So there's some technical terms I need to uh, define for you all. First is prison placement, the process so associated with the political economy of prison building within a municipality. So this pay, pay special attention to local politics. Um, prison siting is more concerned with the state and feds, federal agencies that want to locate the prison. Here. I'm trying to differentiate those two things. The prison town, I mentioned this briefly, and these are, uh, this is some clip art off the web. Um, it, you see the cows on this county prison farm even have uh, jumpsuits. But a prison town or a non-metropolitan municipality that has secured and constructed a prison from federal, state, or private operators provides a lens to understand acute inequality and concentrated disadvantage across several scales. First, uh, rurality. So, 
More than 65% of prisons during the boom were built in non-metropolitan areas. Uh, secondly, region, the South has built more prisons than any other uh, uh, region. Uh, just a couple of other things. Of course, these are poor places. They have a higher percentage of people below poverty. And this is what's very counterintuitive, is you increase the percent black and Latino in a town, the probability of getting a prison increases. The scholarly literature on this uh, is in direct contrast. Um, it was uh, based on a lot of not data, I guess I'd say. Um, so here are the two parts of the book. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, briefly the making the rural ghetto, then uh, finding beauty in the hideous, which is how people make sense of prison building. And then I'll give you a very brief overview of some questions I want to get get into in the Q&A at the end. Um, this is the new Yankee team. Uh, the old Yankee team would be the folks that wrote Deep South, but I moved my family to rural Arkansas to study this phenomenon, particularly, uh, oops, sorry, went too fast. Going to go back, yeah. And the traditions of studies like Deep South, I moved them there. But um, I moved them to Forest City, which lies along 130 miles between Memphis and Little Rock. Uh, the horizon is perfectly flat as a straight by giant brick layer. You'll find swamps, a Super 8 motel, an adult bookstore, uh, billboard hawking guns and ammo in Forest City, Arkansas. There is not much along that stretch for any of you who have driven that stretch. Its, uh, its front door is the intersection of the largest commercial truck trafficking route in the country, Interstate 40, and the north to south uh, quarter of Arkansas Highway 1. Um, I chose Forest City in part because it fits the economic and demographic profile of a disadvantaged rural southern community struggling to attract a new struggling to attract new economic development it's also unique because it has these things going for it if i could there we go uh named after kkk founder has about fourteen thousand people in 2000 i went there 2006 and 7. uh racial demographics median family income and about a year of observation, field work, and I triangulated that with some other sources. Uh, now we have a little bit of fun for you. Anyone know who this guy is? T.I. T.I., okay. Um, Jimmy Kimmel asked him, so where were you in prison? T.I. emphatically. Arkansas, Forest City, Arkansas, the armpit of America. This is from about 2010. Early in 2011, Chris, Clifford Joseph Harris, Jr., also known as the music artist, actor, film, and music, and music producer, T.I., was again sentenced to serve in the Forest City Federal Correctional Facility. Quite unremarkable about this event is that, like so many of the young African-American men sentenced each year, T.I. is a technical parole violator because of drug use. I think he got locked for a gun the first time. So what's extraordinary, in this, what's extraordinary in this case is that a Google search for Forest City, Arkansas during that time will yield as much information on TI's incarceration as the town itself. One could reasonably argue that the, that the, the reputation of Forest City rested in part on incarcerating an entertainer convicted on minor nonviolent offenses. Forest City has not always enjoyed such favorable limelight. This is uh, Wayne Dumont, and he is the headliner in what some call the worst 18 months any town could ever have, locals there. Uh, there were four major events, and I'm going to try and go through them quickly. One was a rape, one was a castration, one was an arson, one was a strike. That's not good on anyone's reputation, right? So Stevie Stevens, 14-year-old daughter, was he's a he's one of the white elites in Forest City. His 14-year-old daughter was brutally raped. Um, they picked this guy up. They questioned him. 
question him. The sheriff lets him go. Sheriff Conley is uh, is a really known as a really tough guy, but he's also a really dirty guy. A week later, two guys enter Wayne Demond's home with a gun and a knife. He's castrated. Uh, it's rumored that his genitalia are in a jar on the sheriff's desk. Right. All of this comes out uh, in in a news magazine, 2020 at the time. Now, he's eventually convicted, goes to prison, serves time. Uh, is he's in prison? He's pardoned by uh, Huckabee, and this his case comes up again. Mike Huckabee, not so tough on crime. That's what's there because he torpedoes Huckabee's second run for uh, presidency because this comes up because he's uh, when he's pardoned, he goes into neighboring Missouri and rapes and kills someone there. So this is all very, very problematic. But uh, the Sheriff Conley is known as uh, he's he's Huckabee had to pardon him, had to pardon uh, Demond because uh, Sheriff Conley was arrested for running a gambling ring out the back of the sheriff's office. So this is like, this is the reputation of the town, right? You had, uh, oh, I'm sorry, before Dumont was uh, uh, arrested, or yeah, before he was arrested, uh, his home was burned down and his family was run out of town. So that's the arson, rape castration, arson. And then on top of all this, there was a strike at the local Sanyo plant, uh, where some racial violence occurred there. There were signs uh, held by black and white workers that said, uh, Japs go home. They united in ignorance to black and white workers who are normally fighting against the Japanese management. And that makes national news. So you have all of these events making national news, right? So for those of you who think, oh, it's, it's just jobs. You and why would someone get a prison to improve their reputation? This is now you're starting to understand why a little better. Um, the for many people living in communities of concentrated disadvantage, the day to day experience of social isolation hardly differs between urban and rural spaces. Aretha Brown has lived in both a, rural, a native of rural Arkansas. She returned home after moving after more than a decade living in the low end a predominantly black na poor neighborhood ensconced between the I infamous Ida B. Well and Robert Taylor housing developments in Chicago. Neither, neither of those housing developments are in Chicago anymore, by the way, they've been torn down. <laughs> there, she confessed she was strung out on numerous drugs, including crack, and ran with the pr prostitutes and pimps and other players who were part of the street life. Since her return home, Mrs. Brown hasn't, quote unquote, hasn't touched a rock. However, according to her, what folks were doing for money and drugs in Chicago was nothing compared to what they're doing today in her rural hometown. She currently lives in the bottom with several of her adult children. An abandoned cotton processing plant serves as a backdrop to her grandchildren playing in the yard with mine. The rusting, rustling, uh, rusting silos and metallic barns reflect the area's deindustrialization and decay. Despite Mrs. Brown's efforts to direct them otherwise, her children are entrenched in the local street life, which keeps her keenly aware of happenings in Forest City. On a hot spring day, we stood in her front yard beneath the sun, sweat and glycerin from her jerry curl beating on her forehead. She confessed, it's like the city, only quieter. She lamented the frequent that the crime and frequent drug-related burglaries in her neighborhood, as she pointed out a crackhead staggering past her home. Now, for those of you who do reentry or uh, other, uh, you know, crime at all, any of you who are interested in that, the same type of predictors for prison building also predict those things. Uh, concentrated uh, poverty, residential segregation, uh, and stigma, all are community level characteristics that predict those things. And this is commonly, uh, those are commonly associated with the ghetto. The only difference I'm showing here is spatial inequality can exist in rural areas if you go down to the micropolitan level, right? You have to get to the right scale. 
and look at relative population density. So in Forest City, for example, the residential segregation index or concentrated disadvantage is made up of two key things. Residential segregation uh, and the black-white dissimilarity index is 0.3, which means it's hyper-segregated. Segregated is at 0.6. This is 0.63. A third of the residents lived below poverty in 2000. That was an improvement from 1970 when 50 percent of the residents lived below poverty. The difference is that in 1970, 40 percent of those residents who lived below poverty were black. In 2000, 80 percent of the residents who lived below poverty were black. Um, and they all lived in a very tiny neighborhood. I can't go too far without being out of the shot. But if you all can see on the left side of the map, that's where black people live in housing developments and they're concentrated and three and most of that most of those housing developments are concentrated in three blocks not block groups not tracks blocks so this is a lot of poverty in a small amount of space um so this is you get a lot of not so great things happening in that area like 66 people return to prison in that area every year since 2005. Um, there's a whole host of other things that lead to spoiled identity. Um, this is more theoretical, but the takeaway here is how folks can, how towns try to deal with stigma, right? Um, and for time's sake, I'm not really going to go through all the theory behind this. And what I'm going to explain is there's strategic self-presentation. That's what Forest City tried to do. The leaders of Forest City tried three different techniques to manage their reputation. Um, there's a lot of theory here, like I said, but I'm going to skip through it. Uh, they tried uh, a lot of different techniques. These are the three I'm going to give you brief examples of um, that they, they, three different strategies they tried to use. So first is saving for a city. This is John Alderson. Um, I use his real name because he is a local uh, elite who's still active in the community. So I asked him, uh, okay, all right, I understand. So even more than economically, I'm trying to get a sense of what you felt life was like before the prison was there. You talked about the industrial base, says he interrupts me. Tough, tough, tough. And I asked him, tough, what do you mean things were tough? He says there were lack of jobs, lack of opportunities. Samuel dropped the like uh, two thirds, a third or two thirds of the workforce. Uh, they had employed general industries closed, a couple other things left. When I asked him why he supported the prison coming, he says, whenever you, it's about a 45 second to a minute pause. He's an older Southern gentleman. Uh, whenever you have a situation where you feel you need to have a campaign to make people feel good about their community, it's probably evident that they don't feel good about their community, right? The campaign included buttons with the slogan, Forest City is great, you'll love it, right? He would later add, if we could cite a high-tech, non-polluting facility that pays 75 to 125000 annually, we would. Heck, I've got the land, I'll sell it to them. But those facilities weren't exactly lining up to come to places like Forest City. This is uh, Coach Twilly. Uh, he's, he's passed. He was a really good friend and key informant. He's the first black guy that did everything in Forest City. Um, he was the mayor pro tem uh, when he passed uh, last year. So Coach has a lanky. 6364 frame, his shoulders and neck hunt slightly, so he only looks like he's 6'2. Although I never inquired, I imagine his slight hunch is from playing golf every day now that he is quote unquote retired. Uh, he's a retired high school principal, but he's still very active in his church and in government and city politics. Um, he he's he's one of the he's one of the nicest men I've ever met. He's very affirming, very encouraging uh, to everyone in Forest City. Uh, he's positive and affirming. And one of his sa favorite sayings was, "Oh, that's just rat poop. Just keep on stepping right over it. Like nothing's that big a deal." 
that don't sweat the small stuff. Just keep, you know, you got to keep on pushing on. He's the first black coach of the football team and the last one to, let, to win state. This is after the fall of Jim Crow. He's the first black member of the country club. So this is a guy who has a lot of life experience. And when I asked him why he wanted to, uh, why he wanted the prison, because he was a fervent supporter of the prison, he said, I didn't want my town to end up like Gary, in Gary, Indiana, is what he's talking about. And he saw the prison as a way to redeem his uh, town. The problem is, that's Gary, Indiana, right there. And I don't know if you noticed on the marquee, it says Jackson 5 tonight. This picture is from around about 2006. Um, how many years after the Jackson 5 would that be? A few years after the Jackson 5. But some of the younger people might not know this. But um, this is what downtown Forest City looked like circa 2007. And I'm sorry for the prejudicial pictures with glass on the window. But... Uh, glass on the ground, broken windows on the ground, literally. Um, but this is more than just about jobs. This is about saving their reputation. Um, there's a host of other ways I can go through to show you this. The prison, uh, the prison was seen as a stabilizer. Um, uh, people talked about this is the uh, mayor during the run to get to prison. I honestly think we're past the bottom of now. Confidence is better than in previous years. Uh, this is a way of fixing for a city. Um, you know, if my, the things in the 90s have done a complete turnaround. It shows people are coming here now and looking for work. Um, this is, they're, they're trying to convince themselves, right? They're trying to convince themselves that the prison is going to help them. Um, but this is another, this is another local business owner who supported the prison coming, but it's a big one. This prison is going to really is a big piece to help stabilize the economy. We can get young folks with a federal wage. Uh, people saw this as a way to generate nothing but good fortune. So it's going to advance for a city. I didn't find anyone who had anything bad to say about the prison black, white, this is the amazing thing. That's why I came up with these three frames. No one, people were somewhat disappointed, but no one had anything bad to say. More shade on Twitter right now. Um, nothing but good fortune for Forest City. There would be no violent offenders housed here. It's unlikely that an inmate in a facility like the low, they told him it would be a federal low security facility. And if one did, if someone broke out, what would he do? Break into a house and unbalance a checkbook, right? This is how they're looking at the potential for criminals to be in their, in their backyard. Uh, who would actively seek a facility that would house rapists and murderers, right? This is an op-ed. Um, they had a, a revival. The RFP, there was almost a revival uh, feel during the RFP. 300 people showed up black and white, and they sang songs about bringing the prison. There was one old guy that had some objection to it. Uh, he talked about mass incarceration and the morality behind it. And this was a marquee moment because blacks and whites in this town are normally fighting, but they all agreed on this. Uh, this gentleman here is Andre Stevens. He uh, runs a, a few different NGOs in the area. Uh, so you figured he would be staunchly against the prison. His wife, next to him, Terry, opened up a beauty shop on the main drag on Highway 1 before the prison came. They turned to profit every week since. Uh, the black, other black leaders got minority set-aside contracts to turn the dirt, to do the plumbing. There are a lot of benefits. Um, so how should we think about prisons? How should we think about these impacts? They're normally seen as consistently negative. They're from a structurally deterministic point of view. Um, this is my favorite quote of all time. I don't think we should use Buddy Billingsley as a way to think about prisons. But this grown man giggled when I asked him, because I, I believe prisons are hideous. The National Organization of Minority Architects, his, uh, as uh, members of that body, 
have come out denouncing prisons, saying they won't participate in any uh, designs for prisons. They're aesthetically ugly. Um, and when I say this to people, like Buddy Billingsley, he says, see all those lights? They're unattractive. To me, that's very attractive, right? And he goes on to say, um, for him, it's just jobs. It's about the utilities companies. But more so, he likes the glow. He likes the glow from the lights. I thought that was just completely weird. I mean, people love the lights in New York and Paris. He likes the lights of the prison. Um, to wrap some of this up quickly, these are this is from my this is from my quantitative data set over time. For the U.S. and the South, there are positive benefits in terms of home home value increasing and median family income right, on both scales, poverty's reduced, unemployment's reduced. I sound like a salesman from the National Prison Building Association or something at this point. But what we have to do is rethink prison building from a different perspective. All of it, there's a lot of, I, I was one of these people until I was presented with the data from the quantitative results and then moving my family to rural Arkansas. And that's why I'm so happy to come here and tell you, and you all sat here and been so polite and haven't thrown any fruit at me. I don't want to see what's on Twitter, though. Um, but we need to rethink prison building from this perspective, right? Um, and prison impact in particular. And we need to look at uh, and understand that their uh, prison impact, period, matters. But overall, rural communities don't suffer when a prison is built. The This is in some ways controversial. It's not just based on their opinion. It's based on my quantitative analysis, looking at places that get prisons versus those that don't that have similar demographic characteristics. The one that got the prison is going to do better. So this is not bold well if, you, if we're thinking about how to reduce mass incarceration, right? Um, and the benefits that it provides to communities of color. Uh, a third of all corrections officers are people of color, right? 22% of corrections officers in the last study done on this are black. The racial politics of this is very dicey. Um, we have to reconcile the benefits that are provided with the, the I'm, I'm with you guys, everyone in this room, I'm assuming, uh, we need to reconcile the benefits and rethink uh, the prison, rethink the prison from a different perspective. I'm waiting on this thing to change to the next slide, sorry. Um, so that's the long way of me saying this. I am not advocating for the role, I am advocating for the rollback of mass imprisonment. With all, despite all of this data that I'm showing you where people are like, no, we want these prisons, right? I am advocating for that because um, uh, I'd also like to make it out of the room, but um, I'm not advocating for prison building as a poverty reduction strategy or as an economic growth strategy, okay? That's what I'm not doing. I'm saying those things, that is the reality that we're fighting, but I'm not advocating for that. I'm also not going to argue with my data. That's the other part of this. I want to thank you all for having me, and I look forward to your questions because I think one of the main initiatives uh, of VERA is reducing mass incarceration. You're focusing more now on jails, but I think this is a huge impediment to the work you're doing with jails. It's just mass imprisonment is kind of like the Borg um, for those of you, for those Trekkies in here. It will consume us all, right? You think you're pushing them back on this end and it just pops out the other. This is another way that it's doing that. So thank you all for your time. I think I'm one minute over. Um, and I look forward to your questions. So we're going to ask if you have a question to please speak into the microphone. Hi, I have a question. Even though I saw the movie The 13th twice, I don't remember everybody who was a, so to speak, talking head expert in it. So my question for you is, were you one of the experts in that no. film or were you no. consulted and they didn't like your point of view? They didn't even consult me. They, most of those people, if they know me, they don't like me. <laughs> I 
find it interesting uh, your your assertion of the the five elites. I'm wondering if that the the elites who uh, perpetuate the uh, building of prisons in these communities is it, so fascinating to me because it relates, in my mind at least, to W. E. B. Du Bois. Uh, claim that the, the planters was such a small part of the per perpetuation of slavery in America. But I'm wondering, is that representative of the nation, that you have these small uh, uh, numbers of people who get together and decide prisons are being built in rural areas? I'm just, I would like to know if that's a representative of the whole nation. Or just for the city. I think this model, um, the model I propose, can be tested. I think it should be tested and interrogated. I'll try and get you back there, see if I can get there quicker. Um, the model with the white elites, um, I don't think it's just for a city and I don't think it's just black people who are being formally or informally co-opted. I think it is also in Texas along the, uh, you know, along the border, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of prisons that are built down there and uh, and uh majority latino towns so i think that uh those those folks are being co-opted too um but i think they also get something out of it there it is there it is i went too far um i think these these people people don't just do stuff because they're duped into it as a form of false consciousness if you will i i, I have to use that word that term uh because I was a practicing Marxist, okay? I was a community organizer. Um, there's a lot of limousine liberals who, you know, they, I'm a Marxist and they got a fat 401k and all of that and they, they get big speaking and I'm not hating on those folks, right? But I was literally practicing like fight the power type of stuff, right? These middlemen are not fools. These black race leaders, they get something out of it. They got something. Right. They didn't just go along and get nothing. Now, poor black people may get some small benefits and I can talk about that at another time. But those folks that didn't fight, it's not so much that they went along. That's the voice of consciousness. The black middle class can shut it down. If you want to shut down prison building, you got to find some way to uh, engage that group of rural, black, incredibly conservative, very religious people. Some of whom could have even, some of whom could even vote Republican, right? You got to figure out how to how to engage those people, black or brown, right? Because th those people were identified as by the white elites as the people who could shut it down. If there was tension between those two groups because of the racial tension of the past, they could have easily, like, not easily, but they could have intervened. I don't, I don't know who had their hand up next. So I'm curious if if you saw a shift in policing in Forest City when the prison showed up or when the discussions of the prison began, um, and if, yeah, I'll let you answer that. So police, this is a federal facility. So policing, people, T.I. lives in Georgia, for example, right? So local police, I have, I really didn't have a lot of observations on that. And this, the, the, I'm, con I'm reconstructing a social, or I'm constructing a social history, not reconstructing. The prison is there 10 years before I get there, right? The prison is there. They had things like Operation Ceasefire. What I saw that, there was evidence of Operation Ceasefire. There was drug dealing uh, after the prison's there. The warden was concerned because she had a large number of Latinos. Uh, and in the prison, she was, I don't know why exactly, she was concerned about Mexican drug families moving there, right? Um, and it was a black warden at the time I was visiting. It was very weird. She was, she was hyper vigilant and concerned about that. But I really don't have a way of answering that question about policing. I imagine if they have ceasefire and other, yeah, I really can't answer that. We're going to go to this side. Um, so you were speaking about um, Latin Latinx communities. What sort of 
experience or through your research have you seen with Muslim communities? Because I, with Muslim communities, because of the, I actually was locked up as a Muslim person and I was totally, rich, I'm way light skinned, right. but my name is very not light skinned or white skinned. It's Shamila Khamami. So um, what sort of information and research have you found on that and kind of like the ebb and flow of what's been happening since I guess even beyond post 9-11, like more recent. So Michael Walker does a great ethnography. It's in the American Journal of Sociology on how the prison is a race-making institution. Um, and uh, you're talking about inside the prison. I did not go inside the prison. Well, that's, that's, I don't do inside the prison. I'm doing the context in which it sits. But he does talk about, if you want to look, you want to look this up or email me, I can send you the paper. Uh, it, he talks about how um, East Asians, I think there's an example of an East Asian because they didn't neatly fit into one of the uh, categories, uh, racial categories defined by the jails. Uh, certain East Asians would be put in with blacks, so it depends on their phenotype, where they would place them in the racial order of the prison. So that specifically answers your question. That's one of the few studies I've seen inside a prison. And then for external, um, just sort of sort of like racial profiling that occurred, you know, like clearly folks, I guess cops pull over like black folks, right? Racial profiling through that. So um, brown skin people that look like Muslims, right. whatever that means. Um, do you have much information or so? I haven't been able to find it. And so I'm just super curious. For that racial profiling, you. are you talking, I was in a rural community. <laughs> So, I was in a rural community. Okay, yeah. so rural community, it depends on where you are, too. So if you're in the South, um, the racial disparity and rate of incarceration is actually lower in the South. So I don't think that means they're not harassing people of color in the South. I just think it's more pervasive. The invitation to go to prison is for everybody, right? It's just more so for people of color. So in your instance, uh, it, you know, if you're in the rural South, you're going to be read as very different depending on phenotype and how you're dressed and everything. I actually had the kindest police officer ever pull me over in the South. I don't think that's representative of police, but I was going 20 miles an hour over near the town that I was studying, and he let me go on without. I did have my family. So, see, I was seen as a black family man, which is like a unicorn, apparently, in that part of the country. So, he's like, oh, I'll let the unicorn go on. But otherwise, <laughs> I don't think that's typical because I was also racially profiled when I did the study by myself. So, that's – and the warden racially profiled me, but I have an entire paper written about that. Oh. Oh, Okay. Hi, me. Um, I'm wondering why, um, in in designing this study, um, you picked a jurisdiction that had a federal prison as opposed to state prison, because it feels um, like the state prison, because it's also pulling people from the community, is maybe. I'd be interested to know whether any of the there's any ambivalence at all, or whether it has there's this sort of same, you know, this is just about jobs, this is just about because it's possible for people who live in that community to feel very distant and separated from the people who are actually harmed by that facility because it's a federal facility, like it's not necessarily their neighbors, their friends, their relatives, right. whereas with a a state facility, you might feel like there are maybe there's some sense of more connection between what the police are doing on the street um, to my in my community and and this facility here. I think that would actually work out better with the jail because uh, you know even within a state, so we're in New York, there's a bus that people get on downtown New York to go upstate. Right. So it's not in most most people aren't necessarily incarcerated in their own backyard. And even uh, the the physical space of this model, uh, the prison is outside of town. So it's not central. It's not like a business that's on the main strip. Uh, it's often three, four, five, six miles outside of town and has to be annexed. 
Uh, so it's very, it's not only socially distant, it's physically distant. So even if you had someone from the town incarcerated, it doesn't, it, it would work out a lot different. I know in New York, upstate New York, because of how prisons were built here, there were, there are instances where families have moved up there, right? So that's going to be a little bit different. Um, but case selection for ethnography, especially sociologists are not anthropologists. We don't, you know, I, I was born and raised outside of Chicago, like, and spent most of my adult life there before I went to grad school. I didn't have anything new to say about Chicago, right, as an ethnographer, trained as an urban ethnographer. So when this question presented itself, I had to pick a case study. So I could move to, I could throw a dart at a map. But once I did the quantitative analysis and found that it was a Southern phenomenon and it, there's um, uh, higher percentages of African-Americans and the like in towns that get prisons, uh, I didn't want to go to Florida, Georgia, or Texas. Those are the three largest prison builders. And any example of a state prison you'd write about, you'd have to write about that entire state. I wanted to try and build this model, which I think is more, I could have done this there, but for ethnographers, it basically comes down to having an in. That's the long and the short of it. I called a guy uh, who my dissertation chair had interviewed during his book, during development in Arkansas, and he was like, come on down, I'll sponsor you. So ethnography is about access. That's the long way of saying that too. Okay, I think we're actually right at time. Um, so thank you so much for coming and sharing your work with us today. Thank you.